you to know that this is not new. This is nothing new. It's been around for actually decades. Um, it's 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 another terminology, uh, but it is it has hit the mainstream, and it's driven by united demand from employees, investors, customers. Um, you know, these three stakeholder groups have really shifted uh, from a bit of a passive to an active stance, um, and are forcing companies. Okay. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Actionable ESG Talk Series brought to you by AKFI Actionable Knowledge Foundational Institute, the world's first nonprofit industry consortium committed to bridging the gap between ESG, sustainability, and digital transformation. My name is Isabella, the co-host of this talk series, here with Manuel, another co-host, and our today's special guest. Hello, Koshik. Welcome to the show. Hey, Isabella. Hey, Manuel. Thanks for having me. All the way from Sydney, Australia. We don't have too many so large, large distance. Uh, you know, this could be the that. record for you, Manuel. You're welcome. <laughs> we yeah. Uh, thank you so much. We, uh, we we need to move to New Zealand to get even farther if we want to. <laughs> 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 thank, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And just a little bit uh, background intro to our audience. Uh, since they don't know you, we know you very well now. And I'm very excited to uh, to introduce the multiple hats that uh, Koshik is wearing. Very impressive. Starting with the formal professional tennis player, as we chat, that's one of my most interesting titles among all, because I'm a, also a big fan of tennis and uh, love to have another talk with Koshik on this. And two times TEDx speaker, a global award winner, business executives, um, a university lecturer, board member, professional coach, and mentor just to name a few <laughs> and over the past 16 years Koshik has developed and in implement environmental social and governance programs strategies and initiatives for some of the world's biggest brands focus on improving their financial bottom line and contribution to society while reducing their overall environmental impact. And um, aside from the titles, there's also uh, very impressive uh, acknowledgements from the industry uh, in 2000, I mean, 2021, he was named as the ESG Thought Leader of the Year and ESG at the ESG Summit and Awards. And a year later, uh, prior to that, uh, he was named as one of the 40 under 40 influential Asian Australian and ranked number eight in uh, Ascent Compliance. Ascent, sorry, Ascent Com Compliance Top 100 Global Corporate Social Responsibility Leaders. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, very looking forward to, to see what you have to share today, Koshik. Thanks, Isabella. That's a long but great introduction, so I couldn't have done it better. <laughs> I try to, yeah, I definitely want to highlight our speakers, you know, all their acknowledgements and achievements i think it's important for us to 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 acknowledge that and uh thank you, and thank you for for taking the time uh sharing your expertise with us today and to start with the question we always have a uh, relatively broad topic to hear where you are standing at at the current stage uh, in terms of what are your thoughts uh, when it comes to ESG uh, in a context based on your experience. Sure. Um, and also just want to acknowledge Manuel, yourself and Isabella for, for this platform and this forum to have this conversation. Um, I think ESG has never been as hot as it is today. Uh, and it's only, it's only going to get hotter, as we know, no matter where we're located, whether in the United States, in Australia, in Europe, Africa, anywhere, Asia Pacific. For me, ESG refers to the environmental, social, and governance practices of a, an investment. You know that could have a potentially material impact on the performance of that investment. For me, the integration of ESG factors is, um, you know, can be used to enhance traditional financial analysis by identifying, you know, those potential risks, um, opportunities uh, beyond just simple technical valuations. Now, while there's an overlay of social consciousness. 
Um, I, th I believe the main objective of ESG and ESG valuation remains on financial performance. Um, companies operating in almost every sector, every jurisdiction, almost every jurisdiction are now um, coming under a lot of scrutiny, a lot of pressure to report on their ESG credentials and policies, as you would know. Um, you might hear ESG being used synonymously uh, with some other terms, which I think we might get to shortly, such as CSR or corporate social responsibility, um, sustainability, responsible investing, sustainable investing, etc. Um, but 13, 14 years ago, I did a PhD uh, here in Australia, and it was on the triple bottom line. Um, and I think, I believe, ESG is not a new thing. Um, it, it could have been derived from this terminology of triple bottom line. You know, the people, planet, profits element of, of, of reporting. And this was a concept that some of your audience might know was introduced in the 1990s. Um, basically, the, the triple bottom line, you know, argue that businesses need to focus on each of the three Ps um, and not just on profits because they would be seen as equally um, important for any commercial enterprise to be sustainable. And I think I believe that concept has since evolved um, into this focus of ESG, which today basically is the bedrock of sustainable and responsible um, investing. Now, pre-COVID 2019, I think ESG was probably seen as a bit of a buzzword um, and it did become a bit more mainstream in 2021. You know, whether it's the, the devastating impacts of COVID, um, Greta Thunberg's, you know, crusade on climate change action a few years ago, or even this new wave of green energy, you know, companies and initiatives, um, ESG issues are simply hot topics. Um, and as a, you know, kind of my concluding remark on this question is that um, the term ESG has been brewing for a while, and your audience really needs to know that this is not new. This is nothing new. It's been around for actually decades. Um, it's, it's, it's another terminology, uh, but it, is, it has hit the mainstream, and it's driven by united demand from employees, investors, customers. Um, you know, these three stakeholder groups have really shifted uh, from a bit of a passive to an active stance. Um, and are forcing companies to step up, you know, against a lot of issues like climate change, social injustice. And as the pressure becomes more and more explicit, um, you know, companies around the world are really responding with the shift in operating principles, um, you know, proving again the power of that conscious consumer in today's market. So for me, ESG, I guess the key takeaway from that question is that it's not new, but it's certainly it's uh, brought a lot, lot more awareness in its current format. Um, and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. And uh, well, many questions on the back of your introduction, your great introduction. Um, I'll start with one about how and if we if we should and how we should differentiate ESG from sustainability. Let me preface this question. There is a lot of confusion or let's say mixed taxonomy uh, uh, when I when we talk with uh, different people in the industry, with experts like yourself. And we had the experts saying ESG and sustainability is one and the same. We should use it interchangeably. We should use it separately. We never should, you know, mix them. So what's your take on uh, ESG and sustainability? And maybe uh, you already define sustainability, but redefine it one more time so we can see the differences and the similarities. It's a great question, Manuel. I think it's one that my response will certainly not solve, but I'll I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, so you, you touched on a really good point, right? You will often hear ESG and sustainability in the same sentence. Um, in some cases, as you rightly pointed out, they might even be used interchangeably, um, but they are actually not the same thing. Um, when it comes to disclosing and benchmarking data, there's actually a fundamental difference between the two. Now, when you think about the larger um, discussions among industry leaders, it usually begins with sustainability, more those strategic conversations about how to start building um, awareness, momentum, and a focus around sustainability. It, the nomenclature does start with sustainability, um, but ESG's scope um, its practices, its metrics, and its relevance to capital opportunities, that's what's really led to a substantial shift in the way companies measure and disclose their performance. Now, ESG and sustainability, um, they have some similarities in that they address 
um, the environmental and social aspects, but there are some differences in that, you know, while sustainability might mean different things to different entities, ESG is about a specific set of criteria denoting that environmental, social, and um, governance. I always say, Manuel, when people ask me the difference, I say, sustain, well, you know, while sustainability keeps a business accountable, ESG helps make its efforts more measurable. Now, that's the sustainability um, equation, right? Now, if you think about the other equation, which where does this term called CSR stand in all of this corporate social responsibility? You know, 14, 13, 14, 15 years ago when I was working and doing my research as well, uh, in tandem, this was a this was an issue that we were facing at the time around CSR versus sustainability, and today we've pushed that from CSR or to sustainability to ESG. Um, to for for your audience's benefit, CSR uh, stands for corporate social responsibility, and that's been on the radar for decades. Um, and it's sometimes alluded to as more of a softer approach, or looks more at qualitative issues. Um, you know, as time has gone by, social issues in particular has come into focus, and obviously the S is going to be the biggest thing uh, in the ESG spectrum in the coming years. Um, you know, social issues is a bit more, it's got a bit more of a technological lens to it today, um, and it's become a bit more possible and desirable to quantify, um, you know, a company's, you know, social impact, social composition, um, you know, even the quantification of good governance, et cetera. So ESG data helps elevate these, you know, these issues to the investor position. Um, and technology has certainly made it possible to gather more um, granular reporting data. So ESG, I would say, is a, is a quantifiable measure of a company's sustainability and societal impact mm-hmm. um, using metrics that matter most to the investors. Um, in the past, CSR was about telling a story uh, today, ESG does that, but it offers that analytical and actionable um, data. So in conclusion, the tr- if you think about the transition of the wordings here or the terminologies, the transition from sustainability to CSR or sustainability and CSR to ESG performance basically indicates a maturation of business practices um, to a more precise measurement of a portfolio's performance. So as the industry becomes more sophisticated, you know, we really need to improve the way we collect and track metrics um, to build ESG management accordingly. So that's hopefully that was a bit of a crack at your question there, Manuel. No, it's an excellent answer. And uh, you almost point to the parallel evolution of the digital transformation, the fact that we can collect and manipulate large amounts of data inexpensively rapidly, you know, real time and so on. So um, uh, sort of in support of what you're saying, uh, the, there is a positive and there is a negative. The positive uh, is definitely we have data and we have massive amounts of data. The negative, we may have too much data, which is unstructured, even if it's, you know, generally collected on the same KPIs, but we talk about 200 to sometimes 600 KPIs. Uh, which, of course, will, will be hard to to measure exactly accurately. Uh, and and um, since, you know, in, in Actionable Knowledge Foundation Institute, we're looking actually also at the digital transformation aspect. And what we find out is that um, uh, regulators, we try to help with some public comments, regulators in the U.S., in Singapore, IOS, but the international ones, we find out that... Um, their uh, consideration of the uh, digitalization, it's incomplete. I'll give you the simplest example and then we can move on. And I think Isabella will have a lot of other questions. But uh, going back to that, um, in order to do data, proper data and analytics, you need standardized uh, data sets. You need to train your AI uh, on the same way. Otherwise, in one person measures in meters, another in yards, and it happens in you know in other metrics. So unless we standardize and we we go into that direction, we are still in, in the data acquisition phase and early data understanding. Uh, to complete, Wall Street Journal just published uh, uh, a uh, report on ESG. I don't know if you have seen it. But they found uh, uh, an under 40% correlation between different ESG metrics and uh, ESG uh, uh, ratings. 
but I'll switch to Isabella. It's just in support of what you're saying. It's definitely we are on the right track to be measurable, and we still have work to do to be measurable. Absolutely, Emmanuel. That, that's a great summary. Um, and the landscape is very confusing. It is not the most consistent. Um, and, you know, there there is an opportunity. I think there's a risk, but there's also an opportunity here. And the risk is companies um, potentially being turned off by ESG. Uh, and the opportunity is for further alignment to try and get not just the corporate community, but the broader stakeholder community towards a common purpose. Um, so yeah, I, I echo your comments. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's very interesting. You brought up risks and opportunities. It's almost like coexisting. And we all, all of these times we're trying to, you know, um, not conveyance, but we try to tell the story how to coexist this uh, sustainability topic uh, between the risks and the uh, opportunities. Uh, when it comes to that, one of the main thing I can think of is to explain to them why this matters, right? You kind of mentioned a lot actually already in your conversation. If you have to tell the story um, to the stakeholders, decision makers, why? Why we do this? What will be your, you know, story? Yeah, it's a good question, right? And it gets asked, I think, all the time. Um, <laughs> whether, you're, whether you're doing sustainability or CSR or ESG, yeah. you know, sometimes we actually have to fight for for some of these topics to be relevant. In a, whether it's a corporate context, academic context, any context, it's a bit easier today. Um, but, you know, Manuel, maybe you can attest to this 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, it wasn't so easy. Um, mm. And so if, if you ask me the question about ESG and why does it matter, I think today it's matured to a point where, you know, you can greatly accelerate market transformation for the better as companies and investors experience, you know, their growing influence and power, their actions and decisions increasingly shape our future and their future as well. Mm -hmm. um, so provided that the political framework, and that's an important one, um, provided the political framework conditions, you know, based on <clears throat> openness, global rules do not deteriorate further, uh, market-led changes can certainly act as a force of good on a really, truly massive scale. So ESG, and in particular, ESG investing cannot really be categorized anymore as the future of investing. It is actually a reality today, um, just as issues as you know, climate change, cybersecurity, data protection, workplace diversity, inclusion, modern slavery, human rights, um, and just fundamentally better stakeholder alignment are now, you know, widely accepted as vital for better corporate citizenship and uh, robust social and environmental outcomes. So while we agree that practices such as greenwashing can be deplorable, and they are deplorable, um, the fact is that committed ESG asset managers, you know, acting those who are acting for investors um, who entrust them to manage their capital, will play an essential role in tackling the key ESG challenges that we face today. So ESG should matter to you um, as it is something that investors now and in the future will demand, whether you like it or not. And they will also increasingly expect that you walk the walk as well as talk the talk. And that is critical. That is a really critical takeaway. Um, Manuel and Isabella from this conversation, um, that is critical because ESG, and I keep saying this, it's not new. It's not new. But if you look at the number of ESG uh, professionals around mm -hmm. the world who have come up as, mm -hmm. as experts, um, I know, Manuel, you referred to that word a couple of times on experts. We have to be very careful on who is an expert and who is not because these experts are basically guiding companies and other organizations on their ESG strategy. And all it's going to take is a, is a very astute investor or stakeholder to know the difference between whether someone is walking the walk and talking the talk. So uh, probably I'll stop there on that question. Excellent point, actually. And uh, uh, you reminded me about an interview with uh, a Cornell professor and former uh, yeah. CSR uh, VP at the uh, Swiss banking company that is lately a lot in the news. 
yes. and he had a very interesting point about greenwashing. He said greenwashing is good because it's the start of the companies. Once they start to greenwash and, and they realize, and they, as you said, there is a huge risk, there is a whole problem, but it's better than nothing. The companies are recognizing the need for the sustainability, for the uh, ESG. And um, he thinks, like in some way, like you, the market forces will self-correct, and the ones which are, you know, continuing to greenwash will be, no, no pun intended, but washed away by the the forces. And uh, and uh, it, he he considers still it's a good, you know, between not reporting and reporting with all sure. the the problems he, he so was was very interesting his point and very much in what you're saying as well um the the industry is moving on and this, this is great and of course uh, when you measure risk there is risk in measuring risk and that's what you said yeah. you know about a, a financial uh a financial analyst that it's just good enough to look at the numbers and say no you you you're not exactly on on the ball with your plans and your programs and so uh, I'll I'll go back to Isabella for for next questions. So of course, we have questions for at least another two hours of interview. If you <laughs> if the morning in Australia allows you, uh, please Isabella. Thank you, thank you for for all the insights and I heard. Basically, I can I can see you're saying the policy and the awareness from the corporates or uh, anyone, and also this. Uh, um, what's the other one? I was just thinking about it. Awareness and the policy, and the the, the culture shift. I would call it has has all of these has put the this this awareness of sustainability ESG at the front line. That's that's basically what I'm hearing from you. And uh, it's it's almost unstoppable. It's not not saying something like, oh, we'll 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 pass that and eventually it will be fine. It, it's almost a, a one way, you know, direction. It's unstoppable. And we can see also a lot of people are trying to jump into this field, right, to be participant or, or to be the expert, to, as you mentioned, to guide people. And you also mentioned actually this landscape is very confusing it's not much you know clear enough to be navigate so for those people who want to participate who wants to develop a career who wants to be the guide in this field what are your advice to them sure thanks um isabella for that that summary and the question as well it's quite <laughs> an exciting question isn't it uh because there's so many kids and and university students and even mm -hmm. career, early career professionals who want to maybe pivot their career. I mm -hmm. just used the word pivot, so please poke me in the eye if you want to. Um, but there's lots of excitement in this space. And I think <clears throat> sustainability and ESG related jobs are are expected, right, to continue growing in number rapidly as they are already. Um, some companies will hire their first sustainability employee um, to develop their program. Some will hire more experienced sustainability people to develop their pro or expand their ESG or sustainability programs. So I think, um, you know, Manuel and, and Isabel, I sent you earlier some some tips, right? And maybe I could talk through a few of them around how, if people wanted to get into this career, what can they actually do? I think one of the most important ones is choosing your path. Uh, sustainability is quite broad, and I'm going to use the term sustainability just for clarification rather than ESG. Um, but it, depending on your jurisdiction, feel free to absorb it as fit. But it, it's it's quite broad. Um, and professionals, you know, they come from different backgrounds, whether I've seen law, finance, marketing, communications, through to more very technical backgrounds, like energy efficiency, environmental science. But in this midst of such a broad spectrum, we you really need to know and communicate your niche, whether you're an authority in a particular aspect, like a human rights or climate risk, uh, you know, a specific industry or a specific process, like uh, a materiality assessment. Um, so being able to acquire and articulate that point of difference in a really crowded and small and highly educated employment market, um, I think that's that's crucial. Um, second, a second tip would be to know your market sector. So depending on what part of the sector within sustainability you're interested in working, you know, it, that, that would require a different set of expertise. Um, you've got to stay sharp 
one of the most exciting things and nervous things, <clears throat> pardon me, about working in this field is this. It's it's still relatively new and evolving. Every day there's something new popping up. You know, yesterday I published a paper on inequality related financial disclosure. So for those of you on the call who don't know, um, you have TCFD, you've got TNFD around nature, and there's something called TIFD coming out. And in mm-hmm. the Australian world, that's a little bit new for us. So it's a bit of a surprise for those of us who heard about the next um, acronym. Uh, but you really got to stay sharp. Um, and for that, you need to be constantly learning in this space, whether it's conferences, research, newsletters, subscriptions, etc. cetera. Um, another tip is gaining real world experience. Um, you know, there's no substitute for uh, meeting the people who make those products and, and working with them. So if you meet if you meet someone or work with someone in this space, you know, understand their context and what kind of change they make happen. Because sustainability people, we are a unique breed, right? We have to think about change management, risk management. We've got to be resilient. Uh, we have to be really purpose-driven with a, with a very strong moral compass working in billion-dollar corporations that sometimes are driven in a capitalistic sense. So as sustainability professionals, you've got to be a different personality and a different person uh, almost every hour or every day, depending on the meetings that you have. So it's really fascinating to catch up and work with these people who work in this space to understand how they do what they do. Um, So I think that's really important. Um, One of the tips that I've picked up in in my time is uh, being more business-minded Sustainability people have a lot of passion. <laughs> and <laughs> passion's passion's only going to get you so far. Um, this is not a passionate world. This is a pragmatic world. So try to get a lens of pragmatism to the passion that you have. Um, think about you know how would it lay out in a corporate setting. Um, and if you do, if you are studying a subject in this space, think about it. How would it apply from a business perspective? Uh, like if you're looking to do a master's, you may consider doing an MBA that incorporates sustainability rather than taking a purely sustainability focused masters that is you know that is my feedback uh, many people will disagree or think differently but that's good you know different opinions do matter um, professionals in our field you know they're really required to have a strong understanding of companies business goals and results you know how the business is performing how your sustainability strategy affects sales um, how your strategy can actually become part of the business strategy that is the holy grail you know if we professionals, um, are successful at integrating these mm-hmm. considerations into core business activities. Sustainability and CSR as a department or a career path may actually disappear in the future because we've become fully integrated um, into the business teams. Um, so that's, I think, a, a really important uh, tip. And then another one is to create change before coverage. So one of the Achilles heel of many sustainability professionals is wanting to see things happen really rapidly. But I think one of the most important things we can have in our toolkit is patience. Mm. If you're really trying to change things and not just have a a PR story, nothing happens in a few months. It takes actually quite a few years, typically to make quite long lasting change. Um, But the good thing is if you do it right, and if you take your time, it's hopefully uh, a permanent thing to do. Now, as people wanna get into this career, please remember it's not just a job, but who you are. So the most successful professionals in any industry will tell you that in order to excel, you need to be fueled by passion for the job. Um, You know, the company's mission, you know, their purpose or the opportunity to solve a problem, which are all fine. But, you know, this is particularly true and necessarily for necessary for sustainability professionals, because if you choose this career path, it probably means that it probably means that you genuinely care about protecting the environment, raising awareness about really topical and hot issues and wanting to drive meaningful change in your local communities. You know, so even if you're not working directly in this field as of today, um, you know, think about how you can demonstrate your active involvement in the subject, whether working with a local community group, getting involved in a sustainability group at work, being active on social media on related topics, I think is a really good way, one that I am quite passionate about doing, and that's to help you build your knowledge, your network, and also demonstrate your interest, uh, interest in the in the um, in the public arena, um, and I guess probably one of the the last two is uh, you know find companies that you care about. 
it's it's really hard to give advice on how to get into sustainability because it ultimately depends on what you want to do um but whether it's you know it's your full time job or not one way of getting into sustainability is just finding a company that you care about and having somehow a conversation with some of their uh employees and then the last one is curiosity ask a lot of questions this is a this is a massive skill not everyone has it uh, on face value so to really you know to be inquisitive to question you know to want to understand the truth and the full picture of sustainability and a business strategy is very important um it's you almost have sometimes like a entrepreneurial mindset in this space uh, and you know it's around making people feel good uh, about what they do uh but the most important thing for you know the next generation entering companies to ask questions and make the request for things uh to change because no matter what position you have in the business whether you're in the sustainability department or not you have a voice hopefully and if you have the desire to change things um i truly believe you can so to conclude on that one isabella i could go on and on on this trying to, for people trying to get into sustainability but the demand for this this career path or this role is coming from so many different directions so many different groups um and that that fundamentally leads me to believe that this profession is only going to continue to grow um in addition to the corporate world you know they're seeing we're seeing so much demand for sustainability in in communities sustainability jobs in communities on college campuses i'm sure you're across this uh positions in higher education and government also provide these great opportunities for sustainability professionals so yeah i'll stop there um and happy to answer any questions relating to any of those tips actually uh, great tips uh and i i can give you a view from the field we uh, put an announcement that we look for interns for sustainability for rkfi and uh great interns came and we we're writing two white papers and research papers with them i'll go into that in a second but the more interesting part is now they are bringing their colleagues and saying do you have a place we 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 want to work together so it is like starting an engine and now it's it you know <laughs> it it's growing and we're growing an organic we are a non-profit we are member we are uh, recruiting members we are, don't have members yet so Uh, it's amazing this this power they bring as interns and i, I should also highlight that uh, uh, one of the first and the closest volunteers is isabella in, isabella yeah right <laughs> in uh, in uh, this and she helped us tremendously with marketing but the two white papers we working is very much in line with what you're saying and it's an effort to understand the market one is what are the roles of cso's what do they report what is their scope of control do they have money do they have a big title a nice office and no reports you know do they have a budget so we conducting a research in that space and the other research we're looking at the supply chain and the misalignment problem and what we defining as a misalignment the big corporations the multinationals are imposing sustainability requirements downstream to their suppliers as you mentioned the es and g right and now uh, these are completely out of alignment pepsi cola and coca cola do they want the same bottles no and the suppliers are are uh, actually uh, and this is another research paper we are trying to determine the effort and uh, it's imposed on the suppliers so very great introduction of what and and we feel this we work with people that are really committed they are passionate about it and uh, and they want to acquire knowledge so it's not only the passion as you said is the knowledge and, and they want to do practical things they don't want just to you know read the book of theory of sustainability so really great great advice and uh, we'll we'll make sure that we'll share it with our audience as well Yeah, no worries, very no awesome entrepreneurial advice. <laughs> When you mentioned that the entrepreneurial spirit, I actually I felt like um all these qualities it's for builders, for creators and I you almost gave me the idea maybe this industry of sustainability could be, you know, another similar function as entrepreneurship because all I hearing it's actually to to tap into a new territory to be courage uh right to to have the mind to continue growing and to bringing your your value and to find yourself all these valuable qualities that position the person to be able to do anything 
almost in in any field so so i i definitely love you put it into this very articular uh way that people can uh, take a real action with your piece of device thanks isabella a new term sustainpreneur <laughs> <laughs> i like it sustainable uh, let's do that yeah take it manual <laughs> sustainable sustainable there you go creating already a, a new term that's an entrepreneurial oh no that's the last thing i want to do <laughs> sustainable sustainable Thank you, thank you. I uh, it went in the record of this conversation, so it's done. <laughs> yeah, let's end the conversation with Sustainpreneur. I love this note, and uh, we can definitely uh, have a long conversation. Love to have you back somehow in the future. Please keep us posted on your work, on your progress, on your updated insights uh everything it's super interesting and valuable to to our audience and thank you again for taking the time and thank you to our audience as well for always tuning in uh make sure you join us uh every week for a new episode of akfi's uh actionable esg talk series where you can gain new perspectives on how to mitigate risks and create value by integrating esg and digital transformation until the next week Goodbye for now. Thank you, Koshik. Thank you, Manuel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I would like to add a call to action. And the call to action is for all of us to become sustained preneurs. Sustained preneurs. Sounds <laughs> good. Thank you. Thank you, Thanks, you Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you.